In this video, what I want to do is go over eight different examples showing you how to find the domain of a rational function. And we're going to work through some very basic examples and then work up to some more, um, more difficult examples. But we're going to keep everything as a rational expression. And what I'm going to do is I will also sketch a graph of the domain and we're going to write the domain in our interval notation. I probably won't graph all of the domains, but at least for the first couple, just so we have a good visual understanding of how to write that domain in, in interval notation, that's where a lot of students get stuck. So hopefully, in the, after you're done with these eight examples, you are going to be a pro at finding the domain of any rational expression. So let's go ahead and get started onto our first example. In this case, I'll have f of x is going to equal to a 3 over an x plus 3. Now, don't make the silly mistake of dividing out the threes, guys. Come on, right? We only can do that when we have terms separated by multiplication. And in this case, there's really nothing else we can do um, to go ahead and simplify this expression. So even though you could probably do this in your head, I just want you to get like get comfortable with the kind of process that I'm going to do, which is going to be setting the denominator equal to zero and then going ahead and solving. So you can go ahead and Subtract a 3 on both sides, and you get an x equals a negative 3. Now, it's important that this value is the value that is not defined in our domain. So if I go ahead and draw a nice little number line, right? So this number line represents all the values that make up the domain, okay? And at negative 3, though, we I'm going to put an open circle because negative 3 is undefined. So everything less than negative 3 is going to be good. Everything to the right of negative 3 is going to be good, all right? But the only number that is not in my domain, uh-oh, not that one. Not that one. <laughs> um, let's zoom back in. There we go. The only number that is not going to be in my domain is going to be negative 3. Why negative 3? Because negative 3 is the only number that makes my denominator equal to 0. Okay? So how do we write this as our um, interval notation? Well, how far left does this number line go? It's going to go all the way to negative infinity. How far to the right does it go? Well, it goes all the way to right till negative 3, and then it kind of like stops, right? There's an undefined value. So I'm going to write negative 3. I'm going to use parentheses. Since it's undefined, it's not defined for my function, I'm going to use parentheses. Same thing with infinity. Infinity is not a number, so that's why we use the parentheses there as well. And then I'm going to jump over my negative 3. And then on the right-hand side, I can say I go from negative 3 to positive infinity. And then we can go ahead and use these with the union symbol to kind of combine them together. All right? So now let's go and take a look at another example. Now in this one, I have a f x is equal to a 2x plus 3 divided by a x minus 4. And again, like the same kind of idea here, guys, right? Like now we just have a little bit more work up here in the numerator. But again, there's nothing like, again, notice that it's just a continuous function. Like we're only, I'm not going to be focused on doing anything that is going to have restrictions in the numerator. So it's all going to be polynomials, which are all going to be continuous. So we only are going to want to focus on what is in the denominator. And in this case, you set your denominator equal to 0 and you get x is equal to a positive 4. So again, using our same kind of understanding here, my domain in this case is going to be, I forgot to write it in there, is going to be all real numbers except for 4, right? You can draw the number line if you want to, but I mean, come on, do we really need to in this case? Like we know it's going to be, the domain is all real numbers except for 4. So we're going to say from negative infinity to 4, union 4 to infinity. So all I'm really doing is I'm just using this exact same template, right? And again, all right, I see some of you thinking, well, why don't you just graph it like you did the other one? All right, fine, I'll go ahead and graph it, right? You guys being so needy. I'm just joking. But I was kind of thinking about it like I'm teaching actually in the classroom, and that's what I'd get. I'd stare at students and be like, what are you doing again? So pretend this is a number line, right? Here's five, here's three. There's the open circle, right? So it's all real numbers except for four. That's how that kind of works. All right, let's go and take a look at another example. Now, this one is a little bit um, a little bit more fun because now we're going to have some factoring. And that's something that comes up a lot in rational expression is factoring, 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 factoring. So you got to get used to it, right? But I just want you to focus on like, hey, have some of the denominator, set it equal to zero. So x squared minus an x minus a 2 equals zero. All right, we need to factor this. Uh, what two numbers multiply to give you negative 2, add to give you a negative 1. So therefore, that's going to be a... Um, a x minus a 2 times an x plus 1 equals 0. Now, again, I'll do the zero product property one time. You have a set of factors equal to 0, so you set them both equal to 0. Right, so then you get x is equal to 2 and x is equal to a negative 1. Okay, so those are your two answers, right? Now, we need to graph this. So let's go into our number line here. Now, here we have two solutions. So this one gets a little bit more tricky. And not really more tricky, but writing the domain is a little bit more um, involved, I would say. 
So in this case, the way that this is going to work is we'll say, all right, let's say negative one is here, right? Let's put maybe zero here and let's put two here. You don't really need to put the zero there. I'm just kind of putting that in context. Like, you know, sometimes you can say like, oh, here's a negative two and here's a positive three. If you kind of need like, where is it positive? Where is it negative? Like if you need kind of like your bearings, then you can add some other numbers. I usually just kind of stick with our numbers that we have. Like here's negative one and here's two. Now, remember, these are the two values that are not defined for my function. So everything between them is going to be defined. Everything less than negative one is defined. Everything larger than two is going to be defined. So the only two values that are not in my domain are negative one and two. So when we're writing our interval notation, just kind of write a just kind of write an interval for each of these three, right? So the far left we go is negative infinity to negative one. Then we have an interval between negative one and two. Then we have from two to infinity. So two to infinity, right? And then you can just connect those all together and you can say, hey, that's how that works. Now, what about if we have the, what about if we have a polynomial in the numerator? Right? Well, the thing here, which again, like a lot of students will, you know, sometimes get confused is like, yes, do I want you to factor? Of course, right? There's a lot of things when we're graphing something, you know, we want to be able to have things in like simplified factor form. We want to look for holes and discontinuities, but we're trying to find the domain, right? When we're just purely focused on the domain, we don't really care as like if, it, if it, we just have a polynomial in the numerator or a continuous function, we don't, we're not really concerned about it. We're just going to be concerned about what is in our denominator, right? And what values make our denominator equal to zero. In this case, you can see there's only one value, x is equal to zero. So my domain, again, kind of using this template here, is going to be all real numbers from negative infinity to zero, union zero to infinity. And you can hopefully see, like, once you have one value, just follow that template, right? You know, and like, it kind of gets a little bit quicker. Now, um, I'm going to kind of put the next number five over here because I know it's a, a little bit more work um, because I'm going to have a couple more um, solutions that I have in here. Okay, so in this example here, number five, uh, actually, never mind, we can do that. I'll put five right here, that's fine. Yeah, I'll just move that one up, that's right. Okay, so for number five, I can have x squared minus a two x plus four divided by a x squared minus nine. Oh, that's gonna be a set that equal to f of x, we'll call this a function. What we call this a g of x function. How's that sound? Sounds great, awesome. Okay, so again, in this case, um, if I just want to find the domain, I'm going to set my denominator equal to zero. So x squared minus nine is equal to zero. Now, hopefully you recognize here, you can add nine and then take the square root. Make sure you do plus or minus, or you could factor this into an x minus three times x plus three using the difference of two squares. But hopefully you recognize to kind of speed things up a little bit, you're going to have x is going to equal to a plus or minus, plus or minus three. Um, and then since we're kind of halfway down, I'm not going to graph this one, um, but hopefully you recognize like following this template Right. Um, well, let's do it one more time. So you have negative three and you have positive three, right? Those are your undefined values. Everything else is going to be defined, right? So again, like using the template that I was kind of like referring to, you can simply just say negative infinity to negative three union. Oops. Why did I like double union that? Um, that could be negative three to three and then union union. That's just connecting them three to infinity. All right, now put six up here um, because in this example, we're going to have a couple multiple examples or multiple operations in our domain. So let's call this h of x. All right, and let's say this one's x squared plus x divided by 88x cubed minus a2x. Okay, now you could definitely simplify your numerator, right? If you're like kind of into that, you know, folks thing, but Again, like you will have a hole and, uh, but I'm again, like holes, vertical asymptotes, it doesn't matter. They're all discontinuities. They're all not in the domain. So again, my numerator is continuous. So I'm just going to focus on what values make my denominator equal to zero. So I can factor out, actually, I'm going to set my denominator equal to zero. Let's just do the whole one real quick. All right. Um, actually, you know what? Let me just redo the whole problem because I do want you to, I mean, I don't know. I think it's just important for you guys to see that X minus our X plus one. Was that? Yeah. Okay. And then over here, you could factor out a what? A 2x. And that's going to leave you with an x squared minus one, right? So technically, you could have an x times an x plus one. This is a good problem. 2x times a x minus one times an x plus one. Okay. So you are going to have the x's divide out. You're going to have the x plus ones divide out, right? But again, like a kind of a key mistake here that I see a lot of students making is they will only restrict, they'll only use this version. Don't do that. Do not just set this equal to your zero. When you're trying to find the domain, you have to go back to your original function. 
Okay. You have to find all of them. Even though these get divided out, they don't mean they're not like, that doesn't mean they're now part of your domain. That's not how it works. Okay. So we're going to go back to our original function, 8x cubed minus 2x is equal to zero. Now this is important for a lot of other different reasons, right? So, I mean, that's like, not like that's bad work, right? I mean, that's going to be very helpful for simplifying it, you know, for graphing it um, and, you know, finding the X and Y intercepts, like that's helpful to be able to simplify that. But when we're finding the domain, we just want to focus on the setting the denominator equal to zero or finding those values. So I factor out the two X, that's going to leave me with a, what was that? A, oh, did I do that wrong? I think I do that. That was a four, right? Come on. So that's going to be a, ah, those didn't simplify out actually. So it's going to be two, oh, come on, two X. Um, why did I want that to be a four? I should have had that to be a, um, I should include that to be a two X. Why don't I just change the problem to a two X? That makes it a little bit better. There you go. I'll just do it from there. Yeah because that just looked better. So if I factor out a two, two X like that, there you go. I like that better. So now you can see the X's divide out and the X plus ones divide out. Okay, so let's just do it as a two X because we don't really need anything else from on there. All right, so now let's set the denominator. Let's change the problem. Oops, so two X cubed uh, minus two X is equal to zero. I used to do this all the time as a teacher. It can, it'd make my students so mad when I would do that. But yeah. And I'd always apologize. Like I'd work out problems ahead of time and like in my head and it would make sense. And then I'd realize as I'm actually working out the problem, like, Oh, actually that's not the way that's not the solution I want you to come up with. So sorry. Sometimes that does happen. I apologize. We could definitely go back and use the original one. I just liked how both of those divided out, but then you still understand that they're actually still not part of your domain. So anyways, let's factor out the two X. When I factor out the two X, I'm left with an X squared, right? Um, minus one is equal to zero. So two X times an X minus one times an X plus one equals zero. Okay. Now here's a key mistake that um, a lot of students that will happen. Okay. And this is the, what I kind of wanted to make sure I still had. A lot of students will say, all right, X cannot equal one, right? And when X equals negative one and X equals zero. Now, some students will also say, well, X um, equals two. No, 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 no. Don't make a mistake. Two is a scalar, guys. Two does not make the denominator. Two does not make any of the solution zero. And again, one of my points is like when you plug one into in for x, that makes that zero, which makes everything zero. When you plug negative one in for x, that makes that zero, makes everything x. If you plug a two in for x, that does not make anything zero. Okay, so two is not a solution to that equation. Okay, it's just a scalar, right? And you can typically just divide it out. So when you set these all equal to zero and solve individually, you're going to get X equals one, X equals negative one and X equals zero. Now, in this case, I think it's pretty important to go ahead and graph these because, you know, that can kind of look a little bit, uh, that can kind of look sometimes crazy of having three different restrictions, right? So we have, let's see, negative one, positive one and two. Okay. And again, you can put some numbers in between them if you need to, um, to kind of get some ideas, but these are all the values that are not defined in your function. So everything less than negative one is good between negative one and one. Good. Between one and two. Good. Greater than two. Good. All right. So again, just like I kind of did over here, just write the domain for each of these little sections, right? So you can say negative infinity to negative one. Then you can say from negative one to one. Then you can say from one to two, and then you can say from two to infinity. Now, in this case, just to kind of keep space, you don't really have to use the union symbols, but sometimes we do like to you know use them just to make just to show how things are um, connected. But in this case, I'm just going to um, leave them off. It is really kind of up to your own discretion. All right, um, now let's go and take a look at another. Yeah, now let's go and take a look at another example. So in this case, we have f of x. Let's go back to f of x is going to equal five over a X squared plus X plus six. Now, after we've gone through all these different examples, you probably come up to this one. You'd be like, oh, this one's easy. I'll just set this equal to zero and solve, right? So X squared plus X plus six equals zero. What two numbers multiply to give six, add to give you one. And then you're like, hmm, what, uh, what? What two numbers multiply to give you six, add to give you one. I, all quadratics can be factorable, right? Well, yes, but not always across rational um rational real numbers, right? Sometimes we're going to have irrational and sometimes we're going to have irrational numbers, or I'm sorry, imaginary numbers. So how do we know what the solutions are with this? Well, what I always like to do with my students is tell them to go ahead and find the discriminant, 
right? Take a look at the discriminant. The discriminant, remember, is b squared minus a 4 times a times c. Now, again, that is all based off of the quadratic in standard form, which is uh, you're going to have your ax squared plus bx plus c, right? So, so what we're going to do is let's go ahead and find the discriminant because the discriminant is going to tell us what are the type of solutions that we're going to have. So in this case, I'm going to use actually my blue, which I forgot to use. So my b squared is going to be in my middle term. So that's going to be a 1 squared minus a 4 times 1 times c, which is going to be a 6. Okay. So 1 squared, and that's minus 24. That's going to be a negative 23. All right. So it, what does that tell us? If the solutions are going to be a negative square root of 3, that's going to be non-real solutions, right? Those are going to be complex solutions. So the only values that make my denominator equal to 0 are imaginary numbers. So therefore, if my domain is supposed to be the set of all, if, if my domain is supposed to be the set of real numbers that's, that that um, can be defined for the function, and the only value, the only values that don't work are imaginary numbers, then my domain is going to be all real numbers. Okay, so this one actually does not have a restriction at all. Um, let's go and take a look at another example. So in this example, uh, let's do finish off with f x again. So in this case, I have an x squared plus five divided by a x squared plus a 2x minus 12. And again, we go to it like what two numbers multiply to give you negative 12. All right, so negative 6, you know, you have 6 and 2, and you have 4 and 3. But which of those have a difference of 2? Crap, 4 and 3 have a difference of 1. 6 and 2 have a difference of 4. So therefore, uh -uh, I'm not going to be able to factor that. So should I say all real numbers then? It's going to be another magic solutions? Well, guys, not so quick, right? Because the thing is, like, it, the, um, if it's non-factorable across real numbers, um, it could also be – just because it's not factorable across real rational numbers doesn't mean that it's imaginary. It could also be real irrational numbers. And again, the only way to test that is to go ahead and use our discriminant. So our discriminant in this case is going to be a 2, right, b squared minus a 4 times a times c. Okay, now here we have a negative times negative. So negative times negative, that's going to be a um, – that is going to be 12, 24. That's going to be a 48, right? Plus 4 is going to be a 52. Mm -hmm. So can I take the square root of 52? Yeah. Now I'm going to need to be able to simplify this, right? And you can break this up into, what, 13, 26? So I can break this into 4. Um, so I can do 4 times a 13. And I can take the square root of 4, which is going to be a 2. Now, the discriminant, ladies and gentlemen, is, remember, all part of just the quadratic formula. So if I needed to solve this, I could go ahead and use the quadratic form, which is x equals opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. Now, the important thing here, this is going to be the solutions. This is going to be the solutions that is going to satisfy this equation. That's going to set, when I set that equation equal to zero, the quadratic form gives me the solutions, right? When you can't factor it, use the quadratic formula. But in, in this problem, though, um, I want you to recognize here, what is this? B squared minus 4 times A times C. Hey, that's a discriminant, right? So I already figured that out. So now I just need to type in my B, which is, what was my B? 2. So I have opposite of 2 plus or minus my discriminant, which I simplified already, 2 squared of 13. And that's going to be divided by 2 times A, which is just A2. So now I can just simplify this. Those terms divide out. So 2 divides in both those. X is equal to a negative 1 plus or minus A squared of 13. Now, remember that plus or, plus or minus 13 can actually mean you can write this equation two different ways. You can say x equals negative 1 plus a squared of 13, or x equals negative 1 minus a squared of 13. All right? Now, I did say we'll go ahead and write this in interval notation. Notice these are two solutions, like two values that are not in our domain. So again, though, like just using your, just using this as, not this one, this one has three? Yeah, just using this as our template we can go ahead and write the domain. It's going to be a little bit, you know, tricky. I, would, I probably wouldn't recommend this. Like if I was your teacher, I would just be okay with my students like saying all real numbers such that X cannot equal um, negative one plus or minus the square root of 13, right? And I think most mathematicians would probably be okay with that. But since I've been doing everything in interval notation, well, let's do it. So I have negative infinity to what is my smaller value? Negative one minus or negative one plus square root of 13 minus. So negative one minus the square root of 13. And then we're going to go from interval negative 1 minus the square root of 13 to, po to sorry, that's a negative 1 plus square root of 13. And then we're going to go from negative 1 plus a square root of 13 to infinity. 
Whew, that is a very big answer, but hopefully going through these eight different examples was helpful for you. And if so, I look forward to seeing you in the next video.